any other one. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Brianna McGinnis and I'll be your moderator for today's session. You're here for the process of collaborative course design and I'm gonna introduce your presenters, uh, Debbie Dorsey and Cindy Kelly. Uh, a 2019 NYSAT Excellence Award recipient, Debbie Dorsey, is a Quality Matters peer reviewer and Maryland Distance Learning Association board member. Debbie has given talks on mobile technology integration and learning environment modeling for the online learning con consortium and digital accessibility for the Association on Higher Education and Disability. Cindy Kelly's professional experiences include the creation of the Exercise Science Associate of Science program, serving as editor on the curriculum work group, and has presented on diverse topics such as Title IX, mo uh, mobile technology integration, and effective assessment practices. Cindy has over 10 years of experience using the collaborative course design process. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> So uh, before we get started, uh, just to make sure, can everyone see? I don't think, yes. Can you see my screen? There should be a welcome. Hi, Ron. Hi. <laughs> I see you now. <laughs> Hi, Debbie. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So so we'll talk later. <laughs> right. um, if, if everyone would, please uh, go ahead into the chat and enter your name and your institution. Um, one thing that also um, I'll, I'll mention is that um, please feel free to ask questions uh, to, if you go into the chat. That's probably um, like the, the fastest and easiest way to do that. Um, just go ahead and type them into the chat. Brianna's going to monitor for us. And uh, we both are, are presenters who will answer questions in real time. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think we're I think we're ready to get started. Oh, and we've got we've got a little bit of animation here. I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off for now as well. You all see that I'm a real person and Cindy is a real person, but uh, this way we can focus a little bit on the, on the slides. I think I'm going to. There we go. Okay. All right. So um, again, we're going to talk a little bit about the process of collaborative course design. Um, we, we've been introduced, and so uh, I'm going to go right into it. Um, let's see here. I think I'm going to. And then um, Cindy's going to start us off with talking about what it is we do. Great. Um, welcome. We thought one of the first things we should probably do is make sure we actually define collaborative course design. And uh, Debbie and I and, and several people at Hartford Community College kind of created this definition that we use, which is shared creation of a course content that applies the expertise of multiple faculty members to meet academic rigor as well as support ongoing course improvement. We're gonna next discuss kind of the different types. Some people um, use different types of collaborative course design. We're gonna show you what we use, but we want you to be aware that there are a couple different types. Um, one we kind of call is a master shell. And this is where everybody has standardized curriculum. Everybody uses the same content, same assessments, everything is exactly the same. So once that master shell is updated, the entire course gets copied to all the different sections. Now, some people use something called a course repository, and this one is where everybody can contribute material into kind of this shell, um, but you can take what you want from the shell, so everybody still has different materials. Now, this one means that you might use different content than your colleague might. You might use different assessments. Um, some people do copy the course content level into their individual sections. Um, some people, but the big thing about the course repository is that it's shared information, but you take what you want. Um, for what we're discussing today and what we use for our um, health and physical education classes is a master shell. So we're gonna take you through that process of using a master shell. So why do we choose the master course design over the other one? Um, first of all, it helps us keep standardized curriculum. Some of our courses have between 12 and 15 different sections. Um, so we try to keep it all the same content. 
Um, this allows us to kind of alleviate that workload for many people. If, if it's all updated, then it's good for everybody. Um, so that way that time can be spent in instructional delivery um, instead of kind of updating a course. Um, we also um, choose the master course design because in some of our courses, we use a lot of technology. Um, we use mobile apps, uh, mobile technology. So if we do have an issue, because we all know technology works perfect all the time, just kidding. We know that there could becomes issues. So if there is an issue, it allows us to make a quick change and shoot it across to everybody so everybody quickly knows the change. This um, also allows us to pinpoint these problems quickly. And oftentimes students don't even know it's a real problem because it gets fixed prior to them even seeing the content. So these are the three main reasons why we chose master course design um, instead of having that repository. I'm gonna send it over to Debbie now to talk about our three-step process of um, collaborative course design. So what I'm gonna take you through today, oh, is that, am I getting some feedback on there? How's that sound? Sound I think great. It's okay. Okay. So what I'm going to cover today is what we do for our physical education courses. And just as background, uh, all of the programs, all of the degree programs at Harford require students to take at least one credit of PE, which we are very happy about. Uh, but as you can imagine, then at some point during uh, the, the a student's um, place at, at our college, we're going to see them, right? And so we offer many, many sections of PE. And we have four courses, four different PE courses that we do this. Now, I think that what you'll get out of this, you can, you know, just, you're not teaching PE, but but what I think you'll get out of this, it's, it's translatable to other subjects. So we start with design. And you can kind of think about this um, as a, a circular pattern. I know it looks linear right now. That'll make a little bit more sense when we get into, you know, deeper into our presentation. But of course, we start with the course design. And Cindy's going to talk a little bit more about assess and update. And I'm going to go into uh, our course design a little bit more here. So what should a design look like? And, and the reason why we bring this up is because if you think about it, you know, you have in a lot of we know that a lot of our colleagues and a lot of other institutions, one of the reasons why a master course is attractive to them is for courses, you know, that there are multiple sections of that course being taught and it helps with that standardization. Now, when from us, from our perspective, then, you know, we need to think about what it looks like to the student and every subject has sort of these you know unique integrations of technology right so stem i'm sure has very uh, specific integrations that that use uh, mobile technology i think all of our disciplines do in our particular case we started to integrate mobile apps into our course design and the reason for that is we needed to find a way to verify that students were actually doing exercise. We've always had some online courses that were PE, but uh, we about 10 years ago became aware that there were some students who were um, saying that they did exercise and they did not. And so we said, well, okay, well, that can't keep happening. We need to you know, be able to verify this is a, one of our learning objectives. It's our top learning objective is to perform exercise. So what do we do? And we developed this course design that does bring in mobile apps. But in doing so, then we needed to think about the difference um, of how a student navigates. And we use Blackboard at our institution, how a student navigates the website, the Blackboard website versus the app. And as we know, even if you know, you're not using Blackboard, an app looks can look vastly different than the, um, the, you know, the Blackboard website. Most of your institutions, of course, have control over when they update their, you know, their LMS uh, 
website, but we don't have control over the, when our, our apps update, right? Um, and so we needed to think about these things in our course design. We needed to think about student tech savviness. We can't automatically assume that every student is going to be well-versed in how to use mobile technology. In PE in particular, we had to think about um, how to communicate multi-step procedures. And again, that'll I think that'll make a little bit more sense in just a few minutes, but these are all things that were considerations in how we need to um, you know, create that, how we need to design our course. And so what I'm gonna show you, and uh, Zoom has the ability to show uh, mobile to, to mirror that up, but I've always thought to myself that that was perhaps a recipe for disaster in trying <laughs> to show and mirror a mobile course. So I've done a quick video that'll you know kind of take you through what it looks like in the app. But um, what you're looking at right now is version 10. We are actually on our 10th year of uh, offering these courses and going through this process. And, um, you know, it's, it's so it, what I'm going to show you, yeah, it, it looks different, right, than what it what it started looking like, but it's always had those concepts, right? That we want to make sure that we're using mobile technology and just like the ba the basic uh, course design principles applied. So let me go ahead and take you through this video here. And this, what we're looking at is um, the way that it looks like to a student when they go into the app. And our course is designed so that students understand that they need to be able to use both the Blackboard app and they need to have a computer because there's parts of the course that over the years from doing this, we know it just doesn't work. In, in the mobile app. Um, so the starting point is different. And then as, um, and it, it's gonna kind of go through this here, um, you can see that the way that the student enters the course looks very different. They actually have to get into course content in order to you know, see a bit more of like the, the guts, I guess, of the, of the course, the, the meat of the course. Um, and then this is when they do click on that, you can see here's all of the, the different uh, course menu options, but this looks vastly different than what it looks like when they go into the course in, um, in Blackboard, in the website. So one of the things that, you know, we needed to consider was how does it look? What, what does it look like in, in the mobile platform? And in, you know, Blackboard, as it's, I'm sure, many LMS, there's different ways that you can put text content, right? You can put it in as a PDF. You can use the native tool. We call them items, build an item in Blackboard. And they don't always look the same. You know, we, we can we feel pretty confident that we know what they look like in the Blackboard website, but it does not always translate over well into the mobile app. And so a good example of that is the outline of course weeks, which just kind of keeps them on track with, you know, what uh, is due and when. And this is using the, that was using the Blackboard tool, um, the item tool. It doesn't always look the same when you use a PDF. Um, we also needed, I'm going to pause this for just a second. We needed to really clearly let the student know, here is when you are going to use the Blackboard app. And here is when you are not. And again, part of that is course design. What, what performs well in, this, in the Blackboard system? We know that if it's set up the correct way, quizzes uh, can, can do, they're pretty good, but like, Submitting assignments can be challenging. There's other other things that don't always work well in the in the Blackboard app. And so the other thing that we needed to think about was, um, you know, how do we maybe repurpose some of the LMS native tools so that they can meet um, a, a need that we have in our curriculum? And one of which is that we need to be able to remind the, the students 
uh, what they need to do. You know, that goes back to that multi-step process where uh, we need to be very clear with what steps the student needs to take in order to record their exercise. It serves as a very good reminder to the students, but it also, and you'll see this in a second, it also serves as almost like this mini contract between the instructor and the student. Hey, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what's expected of me. And if I hit true, then that's my way of, of telling you instructor that I get it. I know what my responsibility is here. So what we did was we actually repurposed the Blackboard uh, test tool. We call them checklists. And so each week uh, students complete a checklist before they do their workout. And here's where I'll, you know, kind of, you can, you'll be able to see that what we do is we give them this sort of series of, hey, remember this, you got to do this, you got to, and I think probably by like the eighth workout, they're like, yeah, we know. But um, at the top, you'll see that there's also um, from on certain workouts, certain exercises, we ask them a question that, that they need to answer. Um, the way that we have students capture what they do is they do a Blackboard checklist, but they also use the Strava app, which is a GPS app. And their camera's native uh, uh, camera, or I'm sorry, their phone's native camera app to record. So when we look at all of these different points, we can have a pretty good idea of, yeah, they actually did you know do the exercise then that's a you know getting into that part of it could be a completely other topic a completely other webinar but the point is is that you know in our course design we thought we, we got to have a way of consistently reminding them of what they need to do and we also need to be able to um, use tools that can capture information so that we know that we're hitting our learning objectives and so case in point here, you'll see there's a, you know, let's get to know each other. Tell me about your current fitness level. So there's, you know, a, a learning objective in every single one of our PE courses that's something to the extent of discuss topics specific to hiking, to fitness walking, to jogging, that sort of thing. So this was a way for us to get at assessing that. Um, and uh, one of the things that we found and the reason why it looks the way that it does is that there ended up being a glitch in the Blackboard testing tool. Um, they said, you know, after they've looked through it, they select true and it, it gives them a point. It's auto graded. It's part of the assessment points. And so what we found, though, was that um, there was a glitch where it, depending if, it's, if there was multiple true false questions, uh, a student would scroll down and then go up. And then all of a sudden the true false buttons were not there and, and that sort of thing. So that's why it's all you know, sort of collectively put in one question. And this is, even though we're talking about design, this is a good example of something where we uh, we had to do a, a sort of an on the fly assessment when we realized that the, all of a sudden the, the test tool was not functioning well in the Blackboard app. Um, and so again, it's, it's kind of a flowy thing, you know, we, and, and I don't want to jump too far ahead. Um, Cindy will you know, explain that a little bit more. So let's take a, a bit of a look at what the course looks like. This is our shell. And so um, what happens is that every uh, instructor, we have um, nine adjuncts and four full-time faculty, and everybody has access to the shell. Um, and everyone has the ability then to go into the shell and copy into their sections. There's a lot of trust that goes on between us and, and our instructors that, you know, they, they know how to do that correctly. But again, you can see here, right, that, that this looks a lot different. And of course, this is the instructor build view. And it's, but it looks a lot different, right, than what it does in the online course. And so, you know, the start here in the course menu, it doesn't show up in the app. They, we, and we didn't realize that at first. And we're like, why aren't they doing things in the right order, you know? Um, and so that was something that we needed to think about. And here, you know, where it says smartphone only, well, this doesn't show up in the app, but we put it here because we needed to remind students when they were in the website that they should not go here and use this, um, that this is something that, that they want to 
uh, only do before their workouts when, when they've got their smartphone. So one of the other things that I'll show you, and I think that this is one of the strengths of doing um, a, a virtual, I'm sorry, um, a collaborative course, is that it, in creating that consistency across all sections and having standard, standardized curriculum, we have the ability then to be consistent in our messaging, meaning um, how we communicate to students how to do something, procedure. It's very nice to have standardized, this is how you do this, this is how you do this, this is how you do this, right? And one of the things then that we do is we have a lot of different videos. And this is sort of, you can see it's kind of chunked out because we need for students to understand how to use the apps when they are recording their exercise and then how to report what they've done. And so this, of course, you're again, you're looking at the instructor view right now. This is on an adaptive release. I'm going to see if I can't just go out here real quick and take that off. And then you can see what it looks like when the students enter. So when they go into it, this is what it looks like on their side. And we needed to think a little bit about, here's another point of course design. This is using the Blackboard uh, course, I think it's a course lesson uh, tool. You know, there's a lot of different ways for us to build content in Blackboard. But we decided to go with the scroll, uh, the scroll view, which is what the this particular um, way of you know putting your your information up. It creates this nice flowy thing. We found that there was maybe some issues when we were putting it in as a learning module, which tends to go this way, right? That students didn't necessarily complete things in chronological order the way that they did, you know, when you sort of force it here in this scroll down view. Um, the other thing that I'll come back and circle around to, but I'll point it out right now, is that there's a lot of things here that are on adaptive release, meaning, right, that it, it's by date or it's you've done this. And so after you've done something in the course, now you can take a look at other things. And that's going to become um, more important or, or we'll bring that up again when we talk a little bit about updating. Debbie, there's a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, have you tried the new unified Blackboard app that came out in August? Ha <laughs> ha um, Yes and new. No. Um, we're still finding that um, from the instructor perspective, it's just not doing what we need it to do. Um, it, you know, I'm willing to give Blackboard the uh, time to to show me that it's going to be, you know, what we need it to be. We tend to look a little bit more at Blackboard from the students' eyes than from the instructor's eyes. And what I'm finding right now is that the Blackboard app, it doesn't really look that different to the student. Um, it, it seems like this sort of integrated app or whatever, you know, got rid of the instructor grade book um, app and just tried to pull it over, you know, into um, the the one singular app. But I think, I think that they're still maybe working out some kinks there. All right, let's get back in here. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Cindy. Right, so um, you just designed the course and you decided how you wanted to set your course up. And then the next kind of phase is, or step is the assessment phase. Now we break the assessment down into kind of two parts because one is real-time assessment, meaning it's more of troubleshooting. And then we also do kind of the end of the year assessment is where do we go from here? How can we improve? And so on and so forth. So I'm gonna start with the real-time assessment. So real-time assessment, like I said, is more like troubleshooting. This is when changes have to be made because there's unanticipated technology problems, um, if a person finds a problem or anything like that. So for example, um, 
at one point um, for one of our hiking courses, um, they completely shut down a trail partway through our course. So we immediately had to have someone go out, find a new navigation and take care of that problem immediately. Um, another example would be if there was a technology problem. Um, so for example, um, Strava maybe changes their privacy settings or something and we can no longer see something, we have to immediately take care of the problem. Now, typically what we have done at HCC is that we identify one person to basically um, make or find the solution. Um, this is because it makes it easier for everyone instead of everyone doing the work. Like Debbie said, we have 13, sometimes more or less instructors per course. If one person can fix the solution and then they kind of send out um, an email to everybody or whatever changes need to be made to everybody, everybody can quickly go in instead of everybody trying to solve the problem. It just saves a lot of time um, and alleviates a lot of that pressure for everyone. Now, as far as who is identified as the instructor who finds the solution, typically, typically at HCC, we ask, we lean on our full-time faculty to do that. Um, and then we also decide who it should be based on the problem. For example, if, if one of your faculty members is really good at technology and making videos and fixing things like that or troubleshooting technology, that person might do it. Where somebody else might be identified to go out on the hike and make um, a new trail or find a new navigation for the trail. So as far as who that instructor is, is typically full-time, but it depends on the situation who um, does the solution. And we all kind of take turns when needed. Um, and it's asked that any member, um, full-time or adjunct, whoever is instructing the class, if you find a problem, they immediately alert all people in the course. Um, that way, um, if it is definitely a problem and a student emails the instructor, at least the instructor knows that it is a problem and, and that a fix is, is being made as we talk. And typically, the, a lot of times the fixes, because another instructor um, emails a person, or the rest of the instructors, I should say, um, because of that, typically the problems are fixed before students even know it's a problem. So maybe my students haven't done the assignment yet, but somebody in Debbie's class has completed the assignment two weeks early or was the first one out on the hike and they said, uh oh, the trail isn't, we can't do that trail, a huge tree came down, that kind of thing. We can immediately take care of the problem, update it in our course, alert all the instructors know, and then basically at that point, students don't even know there was a problem and it's been fixed. So it actually alleviates the 100 emails you get when there's a problem if you, if you don't know about it. Um, I'm gonna move on to, are there any questions about real-time assessment? All right, so we're gonna move down to end of the year assessment. So this is what we do at the end of an academic year. So first year for the, or first of all, for the end of the year assessment, we invite all instructors who teach the course to come in, whether it's face-to-face -face or online meeting, to give feedback. We want to make sure we include everybody because again, when we are designing this course, since everybody uses the exact same thing, we want input from every single person who instructs that course. Now we do these yearly. Um, the reason we complete these um, end of the year assessments yearly is because we teach our online courses fall, winter, spring, and summer. And we do them at the end of summer only because that's the most downtime we have. <laughs> Typically our courses end and our next course starts the following Monday and we don't have time to make a lot of changes. Whereas in the summertime we have a few weeks in there. So that's typically when we make all the changes. Um, now you could have that feedback done prior to the summer because I know some people are off contract, but we typically make all the updates prior to the fall semester. Now, what do we do at this end of the year assessment? We basically review assessment, we find common problems, and then we try to make fixes to those problems. So basically we use our data, maybe from assessments or testing quizzes, whatever data you're using, um, we see where maybe students struggle and we try to improve our course based on that assessment that we've received. Now, um, for example, 
maybe it's a tech issue, like every single student was using this technology wrong, how are we going to improve that? Maybe it was every single student or not every single student. We have a large number of students who are not getting that question correct. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to add more content into the course? Are we going to rephrase the question? Because maybe it was a poorly worded question. How are we going to update our course so the students can be most successful? Um, now, the big part about this is that all decisions are made as a group, okay? So maybe somebody states a concern and um, that concern, we check with other instructors and say, hey, are you having that problem? Are you having that problem? And everybody says, nope, I haven't had that problem. So maybe that issue was only solely for that instructor. Maybe it was the, the way um, they did something or how frequently got into the course. Um, but we try to look for trends that are across all sections. And then as a group, once we find those trends, we decide as a group what changes are going to be made. And we try to come to an agreement between everybody since everybody is using the same course. Um, it's always helpful when you have a great group of people, I know we do in our department where everyone's willing to work. And, and sometimes you say, hey, let's try it out for a year. And if it doesn't work, we're gonna go back to the old way. Um, and sometimes you put, and you're like, wow, that was awesome. Can we do it other places like that um, since it worked so well? Um, but the big thing is um, the decisions are all made as a group since everybody is using the exact same shell. So I'm going to hand it off to Debbie, who's going to go over step three, which is the end of the year update. So um, wow. with the end of the year, it seems like I always get some kick kickback, like on my mic here, like when I first started talking, I, I think it's okay now though, but um, at the end of the year, when we make the update, so as, as, um, Cindy was saying that the assessment, that meeting with instructors where we talk through it, we make those decisions. It's like, okay, well, you know, when are we going to implement those? And so I'm going to differentiate a little bit, and this probably stood out from earlier, a little bit of a difference between real time and, um, and end of year updates, but we'll start off with end of year updates. So what we do is after, you know, we've discussed it, um, after we've identified what we're going to change, we go in after the summer session has ended and we've got a couple weeks there and we make those, we make those changes. And then a lot of times that's um, oftentimes if it's a big change, it's um, a matter of having to go in and make some big adjustments into the, um, the course orientations. We rotate through the full-time faculty who go in and make other kinds of changes. So really it's important here, what I, what I wanna differentiate is between content updates and then course shell updates. The course shell updates, meaning those are the times where we um, assign a person to go in and make changes to the syllabus and the adaptive release. I call it the tedious stuff that nobody wants to do, <laughs> but we rotate our full-time faculty through that. And the reason being is that, it, you know, we at Harford, we have actually begun a process of um, paying our adjuncts for uh, going in and doing extra work. But you know, as I'm sure you can imagine, it is a bit of a process to get through that. And so we just have sort of taken that um, attitude that that we're going to keep it at full-time faculty that go in and, and do some of those uh, adaptive release and syllabus updates. Um, and I'm going to jump, yeah. jump in here, Debbie. And also yeah. just to throw in there that sometimes our adjuncts are off contract earlier than our full-time people are. So we never want to make our adjuncts work while they are off contract. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Although, you know, probably most of us that are teaching here laugh and we're like, wait, do we, don't we work year round? But <laughs> for stuff like that, where we're really looking at like, you know, we have to change a product. This has to be like a very measurable thing. Then exactly, you know, we, people should be paid for the work that they put into it. Right. Um, and so I want to go back a little bit and look at, you know, kind of exactly what that, what I'm talking about here. So um, a good example 
is uh, going back to the orientation, you can see that there were videos, right, that we had in here. Oh, it's lesson plan. I kept trying to remember what was the name of the tool that I use to, uh, that we use in order to build out our orientation. It's the um, lesson plan tool in Blackboard. So one of the things that happens a lot is that we will have to go in and change our videos. And just more recently, for, for a very long time, we were using Map My Fitness by Under Armour, but it just... Uh, we, we tried we tried to put up with them but over time it just was not reliable and so we had to switch off and use Strava and of course there's sort of like this domino effect that when one app needs to change it has implications to all the other parts of the course and so these things need to be um, re-recorded now one of the things that we do and it's funny because you'll hear me use that term we frequently when we when I talk about this and I've had to realize not to do it with my students like it, when I'm teaching a live section and they come back in and they ask me a question I find myself saying well we decided and they're like who's we you know like they, I, I have to remember to say you know, frame it just from me singularly as the instructor. But one of the things that we did, and, and I sort of have been the designated person who uh, produces the, the videos, but one of the things that we do is uh, we have myself and Cindy and then our colleagues, Ed um, Augustitis and Sean Wright, there are other full-time people we record anytime I have to redo an orientation, I create a, um, a narration where, and then I send it out to the three and I say, Hey, can, you know, can you narrate this and then send me the audio and I'll overlay it. And the good thing about that is then they can go in and as they're reading through it, if it doesn't make sense to them, right, then it probably is not going to make sense to the student. And so that's another good way of us, you know, kind of sneaking in an update within an update. But, um, so to, to those are some big changes. Now, another change that we had made, um, and this was based on um, it, what we started off early on, was that we had students using discussion boards. And that was how we were trying to get at uh, assessing that one learning objective, right? Discuss topics, blah, 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 right? So, um, but, but like, it just was not working out. Like it just was not achieving what we wanted it to achieve. And so, um, you know, during one of our meetings, someone said, well, why don't we just have them answer those questions in their video selfie, right? And so that also then changed the way that we assessed the learning objective and, and it changed the, the tool that we used to build that part, you know, changed our course design. Um, so that is what we mean by end of year changes. That's going to be stuff that comes out of the orientation. Here's uh, learning modules. It might be that we, you know, change out some of the content here. Uh, it might be that when we go in, we, you know, we make some changes to quiz questions, like Cindy said, that, you know, sometimes maybe it's just not clear to students. Um, and so that's, those are like the big end of year changes. We try then to keep it as consistent as possible for the full academic year. So whatever updates we make in fall, we try to avoid, you know, making additional because then it, it kind of gets difficult, right, at the end of the year to, to know what you're looking at if at midpoint you, you make this big change. Now, there is always exceptions here because sometimes, you know, like we were saying, this course relies a lot on or we use mobile technology and those things change. And, you know, we say, oh my goodness, we have to make a major change at the mid-year point. But Really, we've been pretty lucky to not have to do that um, because, like I said, our, our goal is to always do an end of year assessment and then a full year commitment to any updates that we make. Go back into here. Oh, and I realized there was one other thing that I wanted to show. So one of the things that we do, because we need to make sure that our students really, truly, completely understand how to, to do this on their own because they're 
apps is, you know, independent. They're, they're doing all of this stuff asynchronously is that after they complete the orientation, they have to take a quiz to unlock the course. And then all of the rest of our content is set up on adaptive release, right? So we say, okay, you have to achieve a passing score in order to, you know, get to the week one checklists in order to get to the week one assignment folder. So then they're also set up by date. And so in what we mean when we say people go in and update the shells, a lot of that is exactly that. It's the adaptive releases that we put on all of our content. Um, it's the changing of the uh, course orientation syllabus. Um, at, at Harford, we, I think probably everybody has, you know, those state and federal reporting deadlines that they have to put in there and we need for them to know because we teach, these are PE courses that are five weeks in length. And so, you know, the Fed and state reporting comes fast and furious. And so, you know, we have to uh, update our dates where we're like, okay, you need to, you know, have passed this orientation by this day. You know, there's a lot of like language tweaking that has to go in and it has to go in every five weeks into the shell. And so we like, uh, you know, we were saying we create a course rotation at the very beginning of that semester and everybody knows, you know, when they need to go in. Um, let me see here, go back into this. And uh, um, yeah, so the, the truth is sometimes, you know, it's, it's very nice when we have, and we find that it works really well that we have design, you know, assess and update, but sometimes you have to overhaul a collaboratively created course because it just gets to that point where I, I always, I, the, the analogy that I give is, um, you know, remember the day when we all used um, cassette tapes, right? And somebody had like a great cassette tape and they made a copy of it, you know, onto um, a, a blank cassette tape. I tell my daughter who's 19 about this and she's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then somebody takes a copy of the copy, right? And then like, you know, you've got by the fifth copy of the copy, it doesn't sound good anymore. It's all kind of crazy. And that's what happens a little bit when you don't, when, you know, when you're just consistently taking a course design and making these tweaks here and there that it, some things can get disconnected and disjointed. So sometimes, yes, you're gonna have to like totally overhaul the course design. I think that that's just, you know, reality. I'm going to so turn over to takeaways. Oh, go ahead. Sure. No, I say I, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so some takeaways. So one of the big takeaways from this is anytime you have a collaborative course design, you need to have, have some awesome teamwork. Um, the team really needs to focus on the instruction. And the nice thing about this is you can we have so many subject matter expertise working to, together. If you can take all the information from everybody, your diverse group, and pull everything together to make it the best possible, which is awesome. Another thing is because of the teamwork, you kind of share that tedious work. As Debbie was just saying how um, every time the course is taught, you need to go in and change the dates and change the adaptive release, and it's time consuming. But when you have that master shell and you divvy out the work, you do it less frequently and therefore it makes a whole lot less work for everybody. You only have a lot of work every once in a while instead of every single time, which makes it much nicer for everyone. The other thing is it provides a lot of consistency. So our design is the same, your curriculum is the same, the instruction is the same. And this really helps out, especially, I know at our community colleges where about half or even more of our instructors are, are adjuncts. So like Debbie was saying, we have four full-time people, nine adjuncts. Well, if every single person is teaching the same thing, if a, if a student is having a problem, but the adjunct works full time or they're further away in the state teaching this course, that student can come in to any of the full time people who are on campus and we can help that student as well. So it's a win win for both the instructor by kind of having less tedious work, but it is also um, helpful for the students because they have more people that can help them um, and meet them at times that, that they, they need. 
So the consistency is, is great. All right, next slide. So that kind of wraps up our presentation. We'd love to answer any questions that you may have. Um, you can feel free to ask them now. If you leave here and you think of them later, don't hesitate to ask them as well. Yep, and um, you know, I, I always say, that you know, you please don't hesitate to email, you know, even if it's like weeks down the road and you're like, oh, I meant to ask her this question, I meant to email her. We are, Cindy and I are both always accessible. I, I laugh and say, we're sharers. <laughs> we love to share what we do. We like for people to get, you know, ideas from it. Um, and so, you know, please, please do reach out to us. I'm also going to um, maneuver over to another uh, slide in just a second here. And it's a slide that if you need to show your institution proof of attendance, you can take a screenshot of it. But Ron, I see that you had a hand up there. Yes. So uh, thank you for this. This is a great process. How many, how would you say, how many courses have gone through this process at, at Harford? Oh, <laughs> that's well, a great just, question. Just ours? <laughs> We have four or five health and phys ed courses. Um, they, uh, Melissa, who's also in this meeting, might actually know college-wise, but I'm not actually sure our total college number. Do you know, Debbie? So one of the so we have been doing this for a very long time, and um, in the last two years, our college uh, put forward an initiative. To, to have more collaborative course design, you know, went through the whole process of like, you know, how, what our recommendations for how people can do this. We did have two courses go through the process. Um, and uh, right now where we're at is, I think it, I think it's still very new. Um, there are some faculty that, you know, think it's a great idea. And then there are some faculty that are just very resistant to the idea of standardization. And so the attitude that we've taken, um, you know, just sort of in our, in our distance learning, digital learning uh, committee that sort of um, helps along with this um, is that, you uh, it, we think it's a great idea. And if you're interested in doing it, there is a process that you can, you know, go through and, and work with uh, e-learning. They've now taken into, um, you know, being the entity on campus who um, manages the process and helps faculty with it. Um, I think it's really just more a matter of maybe, you know, getting it out there a little bit more to people, clarifying for people, you know, what, it's about um, helping them to understand that it's not, you know, turning them into a Stepford wife, right? <laughs> that it's that it's collaborative and that everybody kind of has a say um, in it. Um, and so it, it, it's also entirely possible, right, that a version of this has always been going on in amongst faculty, right? Uh, we know that a lot of our faculty um, have used more of like what Cindy was talking about, where it's like a sandbox kind of a thing where people can go in and pull out of different places. Um, that, that that's probably been going on. And we also know that like, um, like little versions of that, where like if an, an adjunct is going to teach something for the first time, the full-time faculty who's been teaching it for a while gives them their course to copy and teach out of, you know, on, on that first go around. Um, so, so versions of that have been going on in campus, but something that's more sustained and like this is defined as this is our process. We're, we're, I think the college as a whole is still getting getting their bearings on that. And, you know, we, we always just say, well, health and PE is cutting edge. We've been doing this for a while. <laughs> yeah. And um, Melissa chimed in. She said there's two other courses that are officially have gone through um, the collaborative course design process. Um, and also to piggyback on what Debbie said, some <laughs> instructors are resistive. I think the biggest resistance that I have heard from instructors are they're worried about the academic freedom. Um, but I, I will say that when we meet as a group, we try to make sure we incorporate everything that the instructors want to include. Um, so we really collaborate on that. Um, and then we also had another question from Carol asking if 
Um, our courses have been through a review process like Quality Matters or eBlueprint. Um, so our college uses Quality Matters. Um, our course um, has not, our courses, our PE courses have not been through Quality Matters. We do a quality assurance thing where courses go through and I believe they've gone through that. Um, that being said, um, Debbie is a Quality Matters reviewer and she's one of our designers. So we kind of have that background without even really going through that. I have taken many courses and have had other courses go through the Quality Matters process. So there's many people who have already been through that process so that that helps a little when we are in the design process. Yeah, and just to kind of add on that with, with what Cindy is saying is that because this is a PE course that has that mobile integration, some of the quality matters rubric um, it may not fit nicely with this. Um, me, for example, um, you know, do quality matters will oftentimes want um, for there to be, you know, really super clearly linked um, learning objectives with um, the, the module objectives. And it's, you know, how do you show that visually in an online course? And with, without it, with it making sense, but not being a distraction, right, for like what we want uh, students to really understand. Now, I, I, like Cindy said, I'm a Quality Matters uh, reviewer, and so I appreciate the, the process, and I think that um, it's important. And you can probably see that there were some things, um, if I pull it back up, you know, you can kind of see that there are some things that we, we pulled in there as well. So, for example, like um, accessibility statements and uh, privacy with the apps and, and sort of that stuff. There's definitely a lot of that integrated into it. But but we sort of made a conscious decision not to put it through full quality matters because we knew that our course design by nature of needing some of that, um, you know, the, the mobile integration, it, it might not pass <laughs> all of the standards. And it's just because for our way of looking at things, those standards were not, um, in a, they would have negatively affected our course design, the, the purpose of it. Ho hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. And I had something else to add that we didn't really discuss. Um, another benefit of collaborative course design that some people don't think about is a course is already made and created and ready to go, especially if there's like an emergency situation. Like, I don't know if anybody in here has had the situation where there's a last minute hire and somebody was hired two weeks or maybe even less before the start of the course. And it's really hard when it's that last minute hire to basically create everything you need to start on day one, especially for an online course. So this has been wonderful. If you do happen to have a last minute hire, they're like, oh, here's our course, here you go. And then please explore it, let us know. And then after you do it that first year, then they are included in that assessment process. And now they might bring even additional and better ideas to even improve the course course going forward forward yeah uh, yeah I agree and uh, we can't we can't I think under like we really want to stress that working as part of a team does produce the best possible uh course for the student right and that's always what our our ultimate goal is, is to how we can make students be successful how can we enable them to be successful of course in PE it's also how can we make sure they're not cheating and doing what they say they're going to do? But ultimately, a course, our course design needed, it, it couldn't exclusively be about preventing academic dishonesty. It had to be one that also, you know, was, was helpful to the student that they got something out of it. It's one of the benefits of using mobile technology that we hoped that by using certain apps, it would lend to continuing to exercise after the course was over, right? Because they have this cool app that they can use. So, uh, you know, our, if our, our ultimate goal is to provide the best possible outcome for the student, this makes a big difference. Other questions? All right. Well, I, I did put that screen up. If if you do need to take a screenshot um, to 
to provide to your institution. It's there for you. Um, but thanks to everybody for, for coming out and spending time with us today. And, you know, like we said, if, if you have questions, please do reach out. Thank you. Bye.